Hey everybody, Nick here, and today it's time for Ask the Nick number 12. Um, and, you know, this is just an ongoing series where I answer viewer questions. If you got a question there, viewer, go ahead and leave it in the comments here or on any other thread, and I'll try and pick it up. As always, I've got more questions than I can answer today, so some of them will get answered next time. And if you haven't heard yours and a couple of Ask the Nicks have passed, well, maybe I forgot about it or maybe it's going to be a full video. I'm walking through a back catalog here, and uh, so yeah, there we go. But let's go ahead and jump into it and get to the first viewer question. Uh, Main Dave number one asks, how does your fiancé feel about your crappy jokes? Um, believe it or not, she puts up with me and she's still gonna marry me. I mean, we watched the, uh, the Spermy Bottle Opener review the other day, and she was laughing along with me. She even helped me come up with some of the crappy jokes, and, uh... You know, I uh, puts up with them in the everyday life, constant stream of innuendos, you know. Um, I, I don't know how, the, how she puts up with me, but by God, she seems to. So I appreciate that very much. Um, by the way, this is her pocket knife as a ZTO 350. Yes, she is more hardcore than I am. And the multi-tool that she keeps in a little pack when she goes biking. But uh, yeah, she's going to be the Miss Nick for whatever reason. She's decided to go that way. I'm not going to object. I love her. So uh, there you go. Good question there, Main Dave. The, uh, the correct answer is, hell if I know, but I'm glad she does. So BeefyB98 asks, haven't watched some of Apostle P's videos. I've heard him complain about VG10, say it's not a great steal for everyday carry. Do you know what his gripe is? Well, no, I don't. Um, I, you know, I can't speak for him, but at some level, I'm sympathetic. You know, VG10 is a fine steal for everyday carry, and I'm not going to go so far as to say it's not good for it. It's it's okay. Um, it takes a nice edge. It holds it for a while. Um, and, you know, there's nothing particularly wrong with it for EDC. But the thing is... It's fine, and that's really about all the praise I can muster for it. It's not blowing me away. It's, there's nothing particularly great about it. It's, it's just, it's a fine steal. Um, and, you know, I always talk about 8CR13 MOV and NOS 8 as being either barely adequate or barely inadequate. Well, VG10 isn't that much further above the line. Pretty much all your modern steals, um, your S30V, even your CPM154, uh, WL34, those things are, are not too much further, uh, I'm sorry, uh, way ahead of the VG10, and, you know, I think it's uh, a weak aspect of things, and I also think that it mostly belongs on the lower end. Um, Spydeco released the Ouroboros recently in VG10, um, it's a $170 knife, and there, that kind of struck me as a little bit off. At that price point, I expect you to be doing a bit better. But anyways, I mean, it's a Japanese steel. It's fine. It's good to go for everyday carry, but it's also not a steel I'm in love with either. And so I can kind of sympathize with the Apostle saying eh, it's not something he's super jazzed about. Hopefully, maybe in the next few years, the other steels will have become cheap enough that VG10 can kind of slide off the market and uh, be in that same position that RS8 and 8CR13 are now. So it's fine. But that's really about all I can say for it. There you go. Hope that was helpful. So 387 Knives asks, in your opinion, what's the very best flipper under 50 bucks for a budget guy like me? Well, flippers are a little odd to do on the cheap because you need two good things for a flipper. You need a good detent, which governs the amount of force requiring to kind of break the blade free and have it shoot out. And you need it to have a fair amount of force, but then to break cleanly. So this guy has a very, very good detent. This is ZT452CF. This is 200 bucks. Um, and the other thing you need is a relatively low friction pivot so that once you do get that force broken free, the blade slides out very smoothly and easily and you don't lose a lot of force. So it's very easy to make an inexpensive bad flipper. This guy is the Karshan Nora. Um, it's a $15 flipper knife, and right now, as it's configured, and I think I can do a little better once I do some disassembly on it, um, it's not a very good flipper. The detent is way too weak on it, and as a result, it only sometimes flips. And that's that's ugly. That's unfortunate. But that's life. Um, there are, though, some decent under-$50 flippers. Um, the Kershaw Cryo comes to mind. This was the runner-up in my um, Thrifty Thursdays competition. Um, it's an assisted flipper, and that means that there's a little spring, like in this Kershaw link here, that past a certain point kicks in and fires the blade the rest of the way open. That overcomes the lack of a great detent and also overcomes any uh, roughness in the pivot, 
and makes a decent enough action. So the cry was pretty good, and this little guy, this is a Kershaw Link. This was given to me by a viewer, Zero for you. Thank you, Zero. I'm going to be doing a review on this guy. Unfortunately, the knives that I own or that were gifted tend to take longer to review because there's always something else on the review table that I have to get back to somebody. But this guy is definitely on the table, Matt. Uh, not Matt. I'm sorry. Your name isn't Matt. Your name is Andrew. Anyways, I, it's, it's coming there. Another good option, if you want to go unassisted, is this little guy. This is the Cricket Swindle, Columbia River Knife and Tool, Ken Onion Design, and it's actually a surprisingly good unassisted flipper. It's on IKBS, so it's reasonably smooth. It's a very weird knife, and it's got some other disadvantages to it, um, but absolutely interesting, and it's a very good flipping action for the price here. So that's something to keep in mind. And then there are also Chinese companies that are doing surprisingly compelling things. This little guy is a Real Steel E77. A uh, viewer, Peter, sent this guy along from down under, actually. And it's an interesting knife. The action on it is surprisingly compelling for what amounts to like a $20 knife. Uh, it's a Chinese brand, it's a Chinese design, but, you know, I'm looking forward to doing a full review on this guy to see exactly what they got going on here. But, uh, so you can get some decent stuff there. I am planning to do a little bit more on the low end. I've been focusing a lot on customs and higher-end mid-tech stuff lately because that's fun, but it's also fun to see what gems are down there on the lower end, so uh, keep an eye out for more videos like this. Great question there, 387 Knives. Appreciate it. So, uh, Albert asks, what's the most comfortable ergonomic folder you've ever held? I can't give you a, uh, you know, number one answer because I don't have all of them in front of me to test. In fact, I don't have any of these in front of me. Uh, these are just placeholders to have something on the camera. But um, the top five for me, just based on going through some of my old reviews, uh, would be the Mannix 2 is probably the most, if I had to pick one, that's probably it. It is a really comfortable knife in the hand. Uh, that's by Spyderco. The Spyderco Native 5 is another really good option. It's a smaller knife that's absolutely just beautiful in the hand. It just made my freaking hand sing with joy. It was such a good ergonomic knife. The Spyderco Domino is another surprisingly ergonomic knife. Um, it's huge in the pocket, but it's really nice in the hand. So I appreciated that very much. And note that three of the five are Spyderco. Spyderco spends a lot of time thinking about ergonomics. And Sal and Eric Glesser... They're really, really good at designing those things. Another one that comes to mind was the Alamic 247. Alamic Cutlery puts a lot of effort into the Ergos, too, and that one showed. It really locked into my hand in an interesting way. I loved, loved, loved the feeling of that knife in the hand. The Ergos were great. And then finally, the uh, Therum Forge Mordax is a knife that I reviewed not too long ago. It'll go live in a while yet, I think, but either way... It was really great in the hand, and actually this guy, the Ferrum Forge Archbishop, is pretty decent there too. Um, but uh, I'm really a sucker for a good finger choil, and uh, that habit, and so does this guy. So Ferrum Forge, when they're really going on the ergonomic game, they can do some excellent stuff. So um, that would be my top five, the Mannix 2, the Native 5, the Domino by Spyderco, the Alamic 247, and the Ferrum Forge Mordax. Um, Hope that was helpful, Lab, but any of those, and again, though, ergonomics are person-specific, so what I love, you may not love, and vice versa. But hopefully that was interesting. So, uh, Zachary Turgeon asks, if you were to put function completely aside, what are your favorite aesthetic features on a knife? Well, the thing is, function aside is hard for me, because so much of my collecting is based in function. If a knife isn't going to work for me, if it doesn't do the tasks I need, and it's not something I can carry or I'm going to carry then it doesn't come into my collection. But there are a lot of beautiful knives out there that I would love to own as art, even if they're not something I would carry. Some of your larger knives, like your big Alamic uh, Cutlery Customs. Oh, man, are some of those beautiful. Or your knives in Damascus steel, especially the fixed blades. This is a Damascus uh, Damasteel brand steel on a Gareth Bull Shamwari. And it's a beautiful, beautiful effect. I love, love, love the look of this Damasteel, and when it's put into one of these high-end artistic fixed blades, it's just, it's gorgeous. I see these ads on the blade forums for these for sale, and it's just like, oh my god, I want that with the burl wood, with the gilding, oh, I want these things so bad, but the thing is, I'm never going to carry them, I'm never going to use them, it's just going to die in a shelf in my in, in my house, and that's that's just a sad fate for something that beautiful, and so 
I guess if function were completely aside, I didn't need to carry or use what I bought, then I'd probably own more Damascus fixed blades. Because there are just some gorgeous, gorgeous things out there. Tim Zawada and whatnot. Uh, just some beautiful craftsmen uh, doing that stuff. So, yeah, I guess that's where I would probably go, is a lot more Damascus, a lot more larger knives, and, uh, yeah, a lot more fixed blades, probably. Great question, Zachary. So, uh, Ian Anna asks, kind of related, uh, what are your opinions on blacksmithing of forged knives? Is it something you'd like to try? Well, look, forged knives can be just gorgeous, and they fall into that same category, these just beautiful knives that I would never carry. I do mostly folding knives, and those are mostly stock reduction sorts of knife making, but um, there are so many beautiful forged knives out there. Yeah, I, I love them. When, they, when they're beautiful, I, I, I'm a big fan. Um, regarding trying it, I would absolutely love to spend some quality time, you know, a week or two, with an actual master craftsman who is willing to kind of teach and show me how this process works. Not because I'm going to ever, you know, own a forge. I don't think that's going to be the case, although God knows I'd love to have a little bit of a metal shop more. But, um, it's something I'd love to play around with just to learn and to see up close, to get a little bit more kind of intimate knowledge, if you will, of the of the process here and of the the, 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 the fundamental process. Um, I think that'd be great to do and it'd be a lot of fun. Of course, that's, um, that's hard to arrange. That's expensive. And a lot of these craftsmen make their living from selling knives rather than having random jackasses follow them around. But uh, nonetheless, it's something that's really interesting to me, and that if I ever get a chance to do something like that, I'm going to jump at it, even for a day or two. But uh, there you go. Great question there, Ian. So, um, Saitanta asks, if you lived in the UK, what knives and knife would you carry? For those of you unfamiliar, the UK has really, really restrictive knife laws. Things like no locking blades, no blades over a certain amount. Basically, they just don't want you to have tools. Um, it's sad, it's true, and also no zombie knives. So unfortunately, the Z Hunter would need to stay home. In terms of UK legal knives, I actually only own one at the moment, and that's this little guy, the Spyderco Rhodey. And this is actually a great knife. I haven't reviewed it yet just because I got so many other things I gotta review, and this one I actually bought, but it's a great little knife. Um, and so this would probably be my first line of defense. The other one is the uh, Spyderco UKPK. I reviewed this guy some time back thinking, you know, okay, I'm just going to make fun of the UK folks for having crappy knives. But this is actually, the, the UKPK is a great knife. It's a shining gem even in the States. And so that's actually a really compelling option. Um, and that's a knife I would be very happy to carry around if that were my only choice. Sure, I'd miss the Norseman and... Well, I wouldn't miss the Z Hunter. But still, um, there are lots of really good options there, too. But the Rhodey and the UKPK come immediately to mind. Good question, say Tanta. So BeefyB98 asks, Could you or would you live in a city or a state that has strict knife laws? Um, yeah, I could. Yeah, I would. No, I wouldn't want to. I've commented on knife laws before. I think generally they're just designed to give scared people warm fuzzies. And they're so unevenly enforced anyways. They're usually enforced against, let's be real here, already disadvantaged people. And, uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense if you want people to be craftsmen and actually to work. But, you know, that's that's another rant for another day. Um, but I could definitely put up with it. Under three inches laws, I can I can handle that any day of the week because I think a three inch knife is all I personally ever really really need. It's nice to have the ability to carry bigger stuff, but you know, at the end of the day, I can live with that. Um, the more restrictive uh, laws, like you know, under two point five, uh, two point seven five, you know, whatever, I can live with that. There are some really great knives like the Spyderco Dragonfly here, and this is the Gareth Bull Shamwari. Um, uh, there are some really great knives that are shorter than that, and I, I can probably get away with, no problem. The Spyderco Rhodey is not locking, and I could even do the UK if I absolutely needed to. Um, not saying there's nothing, there's something wrong with the UK aside from the laws. Seems nice enough otherwise. But, um, you know, and at the end of the day, if I end up in some place with a really stupidly specific set of laws, and I know I'm going to be there for a while, I might just talk to a custom maker and see if I can have something really excellent made that fits those laws. And, you know, like I said, to be real, I'm not going to be the kind of guy they're harassing about this. I am a boring-looking Caucasian male, um, you know, in his 30s. That's, it's not exactly, I'm not the target market to enforce these laws anyways. Again, that's a sad critique of our society, but that's just what it is. So, yeah, I definitely could, but I'd really rather not. And so I do hope that wherever I end up next is even less restrictive than where I'm at now. Uh, there we go. Great question, Beefy B. 
So OCR96 says, hey Nick, I'm a camper, I'd like to carry a machete when I go, which I use to process wood. Any thoughts on machetes and the steels they should use? Um, well look, I do actually own a machete. I should have brought this out for a prior um, collection video, but I got this guy way back when, actually in Brazil, um, in a, a city called Manaus, kind of in the center of the country, uh, in the Amazon. And it's a, a neat little machete, but I mostly picked it up as a, um, as a souvenir here. You can see full tang, actual wood and whatnot, but, um, I know very, very little about machetes because I don't use them on a regular basis. Um, it doesn't really make sense for me to own a high quality machete or to think about them. I can't evaluate them meaningfully. So, um, there are lots of guys on YouTube who do all kinds of high-end bushcrafting that I, I would never dream of. I'm a city dweller sort of guy. Maybe they're going to be able to give you a lot better information about machetes than I can. All I can do is show off this guy, which I like plenty and takes care of all my macheteing sorts of needs, which are still pretty minimal. And let's face it, if you're doing batoning, you really need to be using a Chris Reeve Nandi anyways. Watch that video. Uh, good question there, OCR, and uh, thanks for giving me the excuse to show off my uh, my sword here. So Jonathan Sims asks, how do you feel about micro-bevels? Cliff Stamp's argument is that you have to remove a lot less metal when you're sharpening, and that makes a lot of sense. I tried it, but I'm curious about your experience. Well, a micro-bevel is a good idea. To give you an idea here, a micro-bevel is, instead of just having your edge be a V-shape like this, you actually do a V and then kind of a secondary, smaller bevel behind your V. And the idea is that... Um, you know, if you're sharpening this guy, then you have to remove all the metal all the way in here. If you dull this edge here, you need to actually go down to another V-shape that's further down into the metal. Versus if you dull this guy, all you need to do is change the, the angle of the micro-bevel a little bit. I think it's a really nice idea, and I will often put them on knives that I'm using. Um, either on purpose, uh, sometimes if there's a, uh, like, ZDP or something like that, if I'm making a really thin edge, I'll put a micro-bevel on with the Edge Pro. But oftentimes, I'll just end up with a micro-bevel because I've been using the knife, and then I use this little guy as a ceramic sharpening rod sort of thing and I'll just hit the knife with it on that and that actually creates a little tiny micro bevel you can get the same thing off of using a Spydeco shop maker and that creates that secondary bevel which makes it a little bit easier to maintain and so by stropping most of the time when the knife gets dull and then using one of these guys when stropping's no longer working and then eventually when it gets so dull that I need to completely remake the V I can, you know, get back on the Edge Pro and restart. So I think micro bevels are a great idea, and they're really necessary if you're running your edge very thin. Like on the Spyderco Nilaka is a great example of where a micro bevel can really save you bacon. So I think it's a great idea. I got no real objection to micro bevels, and uh, yeah, there you go. And especially the shop maker makes it really easy because one of the uh, sides of it does a much more narrow bevel uh, for your main, and then one of them does a wider bevel for your micro. So I, I think that's a beautiful thing, and that's one of the things that the shop maker does very, very best. Great question, Jonathan. So Kevin Wickwire asks, what are the top five items on your bucket list? That's a good question, Kevin. Um, this is not a bucket. This is a measuring cup. Closest thing I could find. But a, a bucket list is a list of things you want to do uh, before you kick the bucket, so to speak, so you can die happy. Um, and... I thought long and hard about how to answer this question, and I couldn't come up with anything. Um, not because I don't have any ambitions or anything like that, but because it has this, I don't know, bucket list has this sense of, I'm not going to be a happy man when I die unless I do X, Y, and Z. And I don't know. I I, I feel like if tomorrow morning I walk out the house, bus just takes me down, flat out, boom. Case closed, problem solved. It's going to suck for the bus driver, and it's going to suck for the fiancé, but at the same time, I led a pretty decent life. If I see that bus coming, I'm going to think, oh, huh. well, okay, here it is. That was cool. Thanks. I, you know, I'm not saying there's not been bad, and there's certainly been bad, and there's been some terrible ugly. Frankly, I've survived shit I didn't think I was gonna, and that's, that's kind of nice. And so in many ways, I feel like I'm already living on borrowed time. I'm already doing, I'm way happier than I ever thought I would be in my life. I've, I've found some love. I, I've helped some people. I'm making some minor contributions to the world. Nothing huge, but I'm doing my best here, and that's really all that matters. And so whenever the... If I just keep doing that, if every morning I wake up and like, hey, bus didn't come yet, cool, and I go out and I try to help some people, I try to love the fiancé, I try to enjoy what I can, you know, look, go on a fall drive on occasion, wave to some squirrels, you know, review some new gem, 
Well, no, just carry the gem for all I can. I mean, just to enjoy what I can do and to help people where I can. And I feel like whenever the bus does show up, I'll be able to get on it without a whole lot of regret. Sure, I'd like to go to Alaska or Iceland. I'd like to visit more national parks. And, you know, I'd like to... That's about all I got, actually. For the most part, all I really want in my life is peace and the ability to help people and leave the world just in a little better condition than I got it. So, yeah, there you go. I guess that's that's my uh, my lack of a bucket list. Yeah, maybe it's weird. But uh, either way, here's hoping the uh, bus is delayed for a good long time at the station there. <laughs> good question, Kevin. So, uh, Jimmy Darrell asks, have you ever thought about going to Blade Show next year? Well, Blade Show is a large convention for knife makers and knife geeks, and it's uh, going to be in Atlanta, June 2nd through the 4th, and I'm delighted to say that, barring some sort of externality, I'm going to be there. I think that'll be a lot of fun. It'll be nice to finally meet some of the folks I respect a lot, like the John uh, Greensmo, the uh, Shirogorovs, the Kevin Smock, and even Sal and Eric Glesser. It'd be great to meet those guys. Um, as much as I am afraid that the uh, Z Hunter people, finally knowing where I am, will uh, send ninja hit squads and track me down, I think that's a risk I'm just going to have to take. So, uh, yeah, if you happen to hear somebody with a really annoying voice there, say hello. Good question there, Jimmy. So 3322 asks, uh, what do you think about the new fidget toys like the Torque Bob or so Flat Top, etc.? Well, I am 100% a uh, fidgeter. If I'm in a meeting or something like that or just thinking aloud, I tend to fixate on, you know, grab something, whether it's a little piece of paper I'm folding, disassembling pens I'm a big fan of, that kind of thing, just to keep my hands busy while my brain works. Um, it's a weird little thing, but it's a thing. And so these things like the talk bar, the Vorso, even the uh, Pepiaka from CKF all look really neat. However, I'm still a little gun-shy. I got burned real bad on that Prometheus design spinny top thing. Um, you know, I, it's only a $20 hit, but it hurt. And so I'm a little reluctant to go so deep into those at the moment. If anyone knows of good budget-friendly ones or wants to send me one for review, I'd love to check it out. But, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure I can justify going 200 bucks deep on a CKF spinny toy. But there's definitely the temptation there. So, for the moment, I'll just stick to taking apart my pens in meetings and doing my best not to send springs flying across the room. Good question, 3322. So, Toad Sticker asks, They say you can tell a lot about a man by his shoes. What are your favorite shoes? That's actually going to be these guys at the moment. This is a pair of shoes by Obos. I'm the company in Bozeman, Montana. And they're, they're, they make very functional, very comfortable sorts of shoes on a regular basis. They're a little pricey, but they tend to last me a lot longer than other shoes by other bigger brands. And I've been pretty happy with them. These guys I've had for about two years now. And uh, they're, they're, they're still going strong. They've definitely, you know, I've, I've put some wear on them, 100%. But they're, they're doing really nice. And uh, I've been pretty happy with them. I've got another pair of uh, a bigger boot for wintertime or for hiking. And then during the summer, a lot of times I wear a uh, just set of Chacos or something like that. But uh, my shoes are a lot like the rest of my gear. Function really above all else. Good question, Toad Stalker. And I hope that uh, helps you understand me a little bit better. After hearing me talk about my kitchen knives and show off this little guy, Toad Sticker asks, Nick, can you say Santoku again? Well, sure thing, Toad Sticker, just for you. Santoku. So Knife Friend asks, if you really love a knife like the Mnandi, why did you end up selling it? Is it not good enough to keep it? How do you make those terrible decisions? Um, I've sold a lot of knives I love, and that's always for one simple reason. I can't afford to keep every knife that I, I, I buy. Um, not only in terms of storage space, that gets to be a little much, but just in terms of the amount of money tied up in knives. That's it's not someplace I want to have all of my money. I want to have a good collection that I really, really enjoy. That's small enough to keep, say, in my bedside table, uh, in the safe, and it's, you know... Just concentrate the excellence rather than having a bunch of different knives. So, uh, there you go. As for why I sell knives, there are a couple of reasons. Um, sometimes I just don't like a knife that I purchase. Um, for instance, that Cody Utzler custom. I've since traded that guy um, for actually a uh, Gareth Bull Shamwari in a nice Dama Steel and a uh, Browse Blades Original Edition Silent Soldier. I'm going to be reviewing both of these, but um, nonetheless, uh, and uh, plus some cash on the side. I didn't get ripped off that bad, but I did take one heck of a bath. Oh, Cody, damn it. <laughs> Anyways, that was a knife I didn't love because it had a bad backstory and it tried to attack me every chance it had. So it went down the road. 
some knives I sell because I don't carry them very often because of some element of the knife itself. The Shirogar of Hati is a great example of this. Stella, Stella knife, a lot of good there. But the thing is, um, unfortunately, it was huge. It's like 3.75 inches, long, murdery, relatively thick. And it wasn't like every morning I'd stand there and I'd see it and I'm like, I should carry a Hati. And then I'd think to myself, well, actually, no. No, I probably shouldn't carry the Hathi, and that was sad, and I always just felt bad, because it's a great knife, and it deserved to be loved, but I wasn't the one to give it to it. So, um, I just ended up sending that down to a buddy of mine, Nico, who's now got it and is now enjoying it. So, uh, that's another reason, when the knife itself is something I don't carry. Uh, there are other knives, though, that I, I don't carry very often, because something else fills the niche, and this is actually what's happened to the ZT450, uh, I'm sorry, 562CF, as well as the, um... Chris Reeve Umnum's on. Both of those were really excellent knives. But both of them, every time I wanted to carry something big and burly and hard use, I'd look at those two, and then I'd see the um, the, the, the Graham Razel, which is currently on loan to my buddies at Birdshot IV. And it, the, 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 there wasn't really a choice there. I liked the Razel way more than I liked either of those knives, either, even though I love both of those knives. They were both great, great knives. And so as a result, you know, every day I'd think, wow, I should really be carrying this, but then I'd see the Razel and I was like, oh, no, I like that way more. And so they just never got any pocket time. And if it doesn't get pocket time, it doesn't stick around in my life. Sometimes I just need the cash back out of it, or I want the cash back out of it. The Menandi, in many ways, was like this. It was a great knife, but it was also 550 bucks sitting in a drawer that really never got carried. And so I was able to sell that Menandi and pick up, actually, I believe that was part of what funded the Neon. And so sometimes a knife is great, but the cash it represents would be a little bit greater. Nothing, not a dig on the Menandi. Like I said, absolutely excellent. But it wasn't getting that much love, and so as a result, because I just don't use a formal knife very often, and uh, so I use that money to buy something better. Sometimes, and these are the really hard ones, it's just when I look down and I realize, damn it, I have too many knives. I've run out of space in the drawer, my permanent collection has swelled to an unhealthy amount, and it's just like, somebody's got to go here. And that's, that's really difficult, because I have to make odd decisions. But there's kind of a survival of the fittest aspect. So I just look at them, and I, I maybe I'll put one in a drawer for a little while and see if I actually miss it. And if I don't miss it, then I sell it otherwise. And so this has cost me some really nice knives. The, um, the, the Graham Stubby Razel I ended up selling to a buddy. Um, and, you know, it was a great knife, but it was just the one I missed least, and I already had too many knives. And then sometimes I get an offer I just can't resist. Somebody makes me either a really generous offer, or it's an offer from a friend. Somebody I really think, you know, I really want this person to have that knife. That's kind of what happened with the Hati. My buddy Nico shot me a message saying, hey, if you ever want to sell the Hati, you know, I've already been thinking, oh man, I wish I carried the Hati more often. Shoots me a message with a generous offer, and it's clear that he's passionate about it. That was all it really took. At that point, case closed. That way my buddy's got it, and... I get some cash back out of it. So, you know, that's kind of the, how the decision gets made. I, I Maybe I don't like the knife. Maybe I don't carry it very often because of some issue with the knife. Maybe I don't carry it often because it's got really strong competition. Maybe I just need the cash back or I've just got too many knives. Or somebody makes me an offer I just don't feel like I want to refuse. So uh, everything's got a price. And, you know, sometimes... That's what it just comes down to. But there are knives that I miss. The Menandi I do miss on those rare occasions where I'm wearing a suit and trying to look nice. I, you know, nowadays, usually the roadie takes that spot. Um, also, the Northwoods Michigan Jack. I kind of wish I hadn't sold that guy because the Menandi took its place. But I think that was in some ways better in terms of there's less cash hot up in it for a knife I don't use that often. And it's a really classy little carry. So I kind of miss that. The Umnum's on. Every time I see one, I think to myself, I want, I want, especially the Tanto version. And, of course, the Sleesh Bowie, which is uh, currently also with the Birdshot IV people. I, I was a knife I actually sold and then realized I made a stupid mistake. And then I bought it back again. So, uh, uh, well, I took a bath. I bought it at retail. But anyways, for me, yeah, I sell a lot of knives. Yeah, sometimes I sell knives that I really love, but it's not a sad thing to me. It's just a part of the circle of life in a lot of ways. You buy something, you get a lot of joy out of it, and if it keeps bringing you joy, you keep it around. And if for whatever reason it stops, you send it along to somebody who it does bring joy for, 
and you get something new in return, or at least cash, to do something else new that you're interested in. So it's not easy then, my friend, but at the same time, I think it's healthy, and it's made a really high-end collection that's very small, something that's attainable on a relatively limited budget. So, there you go. I hope that was helpful, and I hope that you all enjoyed this. Uh, I've got plenty of questions for Ask the Nick 13, but if you got more, uh, if you got more questions, go ahead and drop them down below. But, uh, yeah, hope this was interesting, and have yourselves an absolutely wonderful rest of the day. And please, no more Norsemen. Is the Norsemen for sale emails? Seriously, no. No, it's not. Bye now.